This is my reaction to Gareth Southgate's 33-man squad for Euro 2024. We're going to talk about the big players that have been cut already from the England setup, that have been kicked out the door. We're going to talk about the big players that have been included, some really exciting names uh, in the list. And of course, at the end of the video, the seven players that I think need to be trimmed going into the tournament, it gets cut down to 26 um, some very interesting observations from the press conference with Gareth Southgate. Um, he's talked about Rashford, he's talked about Jordan Henderson, uh, and even Phil Foden's position. We have to start off with Marcus Rashford, surely the biggest name to be cut from this list. It's a weird one. Uh, he's had a really poor season. I'm not the biggest defender of Marcus Rashford. I think Gordon has had a better season, but then Rashford's got so much tournament experience that I think he'll be absolutely gutted not to have at least been given a chance to be involved in the two games leading up to Euro 2024. Uh, the issue for Marcus Rashford is when he was in the form of his life in the World Cup, when England needed a goal, when England needed pace in behind, uh, he wasn't trusted. And I think Jordan Henderson came on ahead of him as a substitute from Gareth Southgate. So even if Rashford was in, in bang hot form, there's an argument that Southgate wouldn't quite trust him uh, moving forward, which is an issue. If you score eight goals and 42 appearances, in all competitions in a season, that isn't good enough. I'm sorry. And I don't think the squad will be massively... I don't think Gareth Southgate will massively miss Marcus Rashford. I think there are other managers will get a little bit more slagged off for maybe not including someone like Rashford if their philosophy involved maybe having you know, more pace on the wings. But I think Gareth Southgate's a conservative manager. He's looking for control in midfield. Uh, and I think he's a little bit more sensible. And I think that's why certain players have been included in the forward line. Jordan Henderson... Lads, summer has come early. I can now celebrate. Uh, if Jordan Henderson had even been included in this list, I'd have been absolutely raging. He doesn't have the quality. He's playing in a, not even a top five league in Europe. I know the move to Holland was to kind of uh, reinvigorate his kind of England form. And obviously Gareth Southgate was getting premier ins in Amsterdam every single weekend, it seemed. But he hasn't been good enough for a couple of years. He wasn't good enough last season for Liverpool, in my opinion. And you look at some of the midfielders. We're going to talk about them later in the video that have been included, particularly Adam Wharton, who have more legs, have, have this kind of higher ceiling at the moment in terms of their career. They can do things on the football pitch right now that Jordan Henderson cannot do in terms of controlling midfield. And we talk about midfielders that have got this kind of leadership quality. You look at maybe David Beckham uh, when he retired from England was kind of included in the setup and stuff like that. I get why you want some of these iconic players to be included for leadership purposes. And journalists were asking Gareth Southgate about that. But I think it's overrated. If he's not going to play, if he's not going to get involved, and then you look at the likes of John Stones, Jordan Pickford, Harry Kane, Declan Rice, who is literally what Jordan Henderson used to do. You know, Declan Rice is Jordan Henderson 2.0. He's, he's five times the player of Jordan Henderson because he can control the game. Jordan Henderson was never good at controlling the game, always plays it sideways. Declan Rice, Drew Bellingham, the leadership comes from an example on the pitch. Yes, Jordan Henderson is a legend for England on so many levels. He's been in and around the squad that has been more successful than any England generation since 1966. Um, a massive player, but he's not good enough right now to influence England to win a trophy. And that's what it is all about, literally. Raheem Sterling is uh, more of a name that I think is understandable from England fans to not be included, but a little bit bittersweet. This guy's been involved in every England tournament since 2014. That's 10 years of service where he has been really, really effective. Linked up very, very well with Harry Kane in 20, well, 2021 and 2018. Um, so much experience. And at points this season for Chelsea, had a few good games here and there. But all in all, it has been a negative experience at Chelsea. We have to be completely honest. And, and I don't think he deserves to get in over Anthony Gordon. As I look at this squad, you begin to realise that the context of Gareth Southgate is important. His last uh, time as England manager, we can all be critical of his performances in-game during big moments in his time as England manager. But the one thing we can't debate is, is his kind of legacy for promoting positivity and promoting this kind of long-term approach to being an England manager. Uh, someone like Capello coming in was short-term and it was really bitter. And Southgate including certain players like the Whartons of the world, like Eze's of the world, um, Kobe Maino in particular, and of course um, players that are going to replace Sterling and Jordan Henderson, like Anthony Gordon, can be, if he doesn't win the trophy this season, it can be his lasting impact on the England squad is, is getting this squad right and introducing players that are going to be fruitful for England and future England managers. Ben Chilwell left out. I think that's down to Joe Gomez's quality form. I think Joe Gomez is now back up 
to Luke Shaw. And yeah, there'll be criticisms about Luke Shaw because he's not played much uh, this season. He's missed so many football matches in the last few years. But when he does play for England, he's fantastic. He can play in a five. He can play in a four. He's been England's best left back, arguably, since Ashley Cole. So you have to, you have to, get, you have, to have a little bit of trust. The, the trust with Jordan Henderson, for, for example, isn't there because he's way past his prime and he's playing in Saudi Arabia, then Ajax, who one of the worst Ajax sides of the last 10 years. Luke Shaw, only a couple of years ago, was one of the best left backs in the league. So that, that's the reality. And you have to, you have to be balanced. You can't, just, you can't just have a side of pure players that are all in form because we have no left backs. We don't have a left back who's currently in form. Uh, Luke Shaw can find that form. He just needs to find fitness, and that's the difference for me. Uh, I think it's a really good call to keep Ben uh, Ben Chua out of the squad. Luke Shaw and Joe Gomez, for me, makes a lot of sense. And, of course, Kieran Trippier as well. Um, Eric Dyer might be a little bit aggrieved. He's done very well in the Champions League for Bayern Munich. Um, I can understand why, though, again, a lasting impression for Gareth Southgate on his time as England manager might be the inclusion of more wildcard younger players like Jared Branthwaite coming in. Um, and allowing the Eric Dyers of the world, the Hendersons of the world, to be an afterthought and to look back at their time, you know, in 2016. Eric Dyer was fantastic in 2016, relatively in a really poor campaign, uh, and the 2018s and, and those kind of seasons. We have to look at the future as England fans. Right, we're going to look through the whole England squad and just make some comments about goalkeepers, defence, midfield, and attack, and we're going to cut seven players that I think need to get out of the squad before the actual tournament. Obviously, the keeper de department might be the easiest. I like that James Trafford has been kept in and around the fold, even for at least a couple of games. I know he's been poor for Burnley, but very, very successful for the England under-21s, of course. Um, and he, he, he could be a really, really exciting goalkeeper for, for England in the future. So I like the fact that he's still in there and there's a bit of loyalty. The defenders that kind of surround the obvious picks in terms of Carl Walker, John Stones, um, and whoever plays left back because of Luke Shaw's kind of injury problems, it kind of reflects in this squad that I think Gareth Southgate is spread betting a little bit and seeing who performs well in training, who arrives fit as well. Obviously, there's a few players in this lineup who've got niggles and aren't fully fit. John Stones is one of them as well. Um, Jared Branthwaite, for me, might have the boldest claim of starting alongside John Stones if it isn't the regulars, if that makes sense. Uh, I know Mark Gahey's fantastic. Joe Gomez looks to me more like a, like a left back. I think Jarrell Quanza, despite being so young and inexperienced, um, showing so much quality for Liverpool this season, uh, I don't see him necessarily even making the side. But we're gonna we're gonna cut the players at the end of this video. But Branthwaite, fantastic. I really really like that. Lewis Dunk, he's been in the setup for a few years, of course. Um, I don't see him necessarily starting either. Joe Gomez, Mark Gahey, Konza. I like Konza as well. He's been so important for Aston Villa. Um, he's such a smart player. He never looks like he's out of control. He always looks like he's level-headed. And I think England will need that massively in this setup. Harry Maguire, I mean, people are going to criticise it all the time. You need, you do need that mixture of experience. And Harry Maguire, you know, the last Euros was one of the defenders of the tournament in the official 11. So I still think Harry Maguire hasn't let his country down. He scored a big penalty in the Euros final. So you talk about bottle, you talk about performances for England. I think it's as close as it's ever been for the likes of Branthwaite and Mark Gahey to come in and actually replace Harry Maguire in that starting 11. But again, any injuries, any changes in kind of form for those players, then Harry Maguire is a big, big player for, for England just for a bit of... Uh, steadiness in the squad no question about it um Luke Shaw John Stones Kieran Trippier and Carl Walker uh it's interesting no Reese James of course I think it's just the lack of form and the lack of in, uh, uh the amount of injuries he's had in the last few seasons I don't think it's a massive one to really talk about Carl Walker for me is the starting right back all day long if Gareth Southgate ever wanted to experiment with a back five I think it'd be very questioned these days based on the amount of quality midfield you, you have that flexibility with Trippier, Carl Walker uh, uh, and the likes of Joe Gomez and Luke Shaw that can all play in a kind of back five and be a bit more versatile. But I think Kieran Trippier makes perfect sense, as does Carl Walker and, of course, John Stones. I think John Stones is the most important player for England. I know it sounds ridiculous. Declan Rice is up there, of course, and Jordan Pitford. I think if you drop Jordan Pitford, it's, it's a world of pain. But I think England could win this tournament with the right managerial setup without Harry Kane. You know, it sounds crazy, but I think you could... I think there's a world you could put in Ollie Watkins and, and have a run. Uh, Cole Palmer as a false nine, have a run. Not saying he should do that. Um, but I think without John Stones, there's no ability to play out from the back. There's a lack of leadership. And I think his defensive quality off the ball is so underrated. John Stones is imperative to this bat line for England.
Trent Alexander-Arnold has been included as a midfielder in this England uh, uh, setup. It's very interesting because you're essentially taking four players that can play right back. Well, Concert can play right back as well. So it's five. If you include Joe Gomez as a potential right back, Carl Walker, Kieran Trippier, uh, Trent Alexander-Arnold, it's a lot. So it actually suggests to me that I think if Trent was left out, then you're saying you're, you're calling him a right back. The fact he's been included uh, means that there is a big chance that he plays in the Euros as a midfielder. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that happens. He's not really built a relationship with Drew Bellingham, Declan Rice, Phil Foden in midfield. He's only played a few times there. I would be critical of that if it was a big game in the Euros, if it was a knockout game, quarterfinals, Trent in midfield over someone else like, you know, over Kobe Maynard, over Conor Gallagher. I think it would be a massive leap and a massive gamble. But he's in the side. And I think you have to have someone with that technical ability to be at least in the squad. Uh, he's a Champions League winner, man. He's a Premier League winner. He's one, of the, he's one of the greats for Liverpool ever in that position. So I, I don't mind it. I do question if he starts in midfield for England. I don't think he should be doing that, in my honest opinion. Um, Conor Gallagher, I like that a lot. You need legs in tournaments, especially in the heat. And Conor Gallagher is maybe the fittest player for England, so it makes a lot of sense for me off the ball. Curtis Jones, I like that. Very, very underrated player. And sometimes you need to pick players that are on the fringes a little bit or haven't got loads of experience. Curtis Jones has got loads of Liverpool experience. He has not got loads of England experience. So sometimes you can just... You can, it's about timing sometimes with these squads. Bring in a player... And I think he'll absolutely relish playing for England, Curtis Jones, uh, certainly alongside Trent Alexander-Arnold as well in that squad uh, and a few other kind of Liverpool connections. It's very, very strong. I like Curtis Jones a lot. Kobe Maino is the big one for me. He, If he arrives at the England setup in the right headspace, in the right form, in the right fitness, he might be the answer to the midfield dilemma for England. Um, the balance there when... Uh, Bellingham and Rice are, are bombing forward. Two players that have been asked to play as, as attacking midfielders for their club sides. You need someone that's going to sit. I don't really back uh, Curtis Jones or Conor Gallagher to be a true sitting defensive midfielder. And we need one of them. Um, Cobby Maino and Adam Wharton are the two that kind of really, really sit. Declan Rice can sit. Jude Bellingham can sit. But I've got a feeling that obviously those two players will be asked to contribute moving forward um, and influence games through midfield. And that means one of Maino or Adam Wharton has to be the one that balances it out. I think Wharton, for me, feels like someone that's more being brought in for vibes, being brought in to congratulate how good he's been. He's been absolutely immense. If you're being completely ruthless, I think he's in currently better form than Kobe Maino. But Kobe Maino's been involved with England slightly longer. He's been playing at obviously a bigger club. I think that matters. Adam Wharton, nine months ago, was playing against Rotherham in the championship. It, with all due respect, his trajectory is incredible. I've been massively... Uh, uh, gassing him up on this channel uh, for a few months now. Um, Kobe Maynard, for me, is the one that starts ahead of Adam Wharton. And there, that therein lies the question, do you keep Adam Wharton in the side if Curtis Jones um, and if Trent Alexander-Arnold are all in the setup as well? The forwards are very interesting. Uh, Gareth Southgate came out and kind of said, it's not my job to kind of decide who's in the forward or midfield category because the midfield box looks very small. But then you look at the forwards line, you've got Jude Bellingham in there. Obviously, he'll be a midfielder. Um, it'd be interesting if anything happens to Harry Kane, God forbid, could you see Jude Bellingham as a, as a false nine, the kind of the way he uh, ran past Hosselu in so many games this season when Real Madrid won the league and potentially the Champions League as well. Jared Bowen, Eze, are two players that are kind of on the fringes. They're never going to start for England in the first game, in my opinion, unless there are injuries, of course. Uh, but fantastic players, and they've been uh, fairly rewarded with an England place. Um, Phil Foden asked by uh, journalists in the press conference today if he's a left winger. It was a bit of a dubious response. Uh, and as a City fan, uh, it's frustrating. Phil Foden is a central midfielder. He can influence things at the highest level in midfield if you stick him on the left wing and he has to beat someone on the outside he hasn't got pace in his game in the same way he's got pace as a midfielder in the same same way David Silva or Iniesta could get away from someone in midfield or Fabregas but he has not got that pace to be a winger he's not Anthony Gordon he's not you know someone like Jaden Sancho maybe what he's doing at Dortmund for example even Rashford you know these guys that hold it high on the wing and run into space that is not Phil Foden if you think he's a left winger Please, just never talk to me on the internet. It's it's embarrassing. I, I don't want Phil Foden to play for England if he plays on the left wing. He has to be playing centrally. Maybe right wing where he can come into midfield and influence things on his left foot. But do not shove him on the left wing. If that happens first game of the season, I might actually turn the TV off. I'm not even joking. Um, 
Anthony Gordon, a million percent. He's that Rashford kind of guy. He's the pace in behind. He's the explosivity. He's got far more of a, a better first touch, than my, in my opinion, than Rashford. He hasn't got the experience, but he's got that He's got that close control. He's got a good finish on him, and he's in far better form and confidence than Marcus Rashford, so it makes a lot of sense for me. Jack Grealish is massively, massively dubious for a lot of people, and I, I don't really get it because you have this mixture of Jack Grealish being able to be incredibly experienced, one of the most decorated English players in the squad. You don't just randomly drop him. He hasn't played loads in the last few weeks. Um, he has been car carrying a knock at points this season, um, and Doku has been preferred in certain games for explosivity. But it's a Jack Grealish that can receive the ball at any angle. He can draw a foul at any position, push England up the pitch with set pieces, which, which will be important with how we've done well in tournaments previously. Um, and I think, I think control is a massive thing in tournament football. We talk about England always whipping balls first time. Uh, David Beckham, I think, used to be a little bit guilty of that in certain tournaments, just getting the ball and pumping it long all the time. Jack Grealish will not do that. He, he's got so much control and he gives England an extra 5 or 10% possession in big moments. And I think that's why, why it's so important. If he starts or not, that is a debate for another day. Harry Kane, what can I say? Um, he will be starting. He's probably the first name on the team sheet. Um, I don't want him dropping deep in this England setup. Please stay up front. James Madison, I think it's just based on the first six months of form. Obviously, the last couple of years as well for Leicester City has been absolutely unreal. I do like the fact he's been included. I actually kind of rank him ahead of Eze, in my opinion, for who should be coming on to influence England games at, uh, in big moments. I think James Madison still outreaches Eze at the moment, but Eze is getting closer every single season. Cole Palmer is the one for me. I think if Gareth Southgate is serious about winning this tournament, you have to play Foden. You have to. You have to play Rice. You have to play Bellingham. And you have to play Cole Palmer. Cole Palmer is having a, as good a season as Foden. I'll doubt his kind of credibility in terms of controlling the game in the same way Phil Foden has. He just hasn't got that experience. The individual technical brilliance. We talk about how Jude Bellingham's doing these little one-time finishes and running past people. Cole Palmer is at that level. Cole Palmer could do what Jude Bellingham's doing at Real Madrid. A million percent. He's doing it for a far worse side. Uh, he's, he's, he's an explosive player. And I, I think players wouldn't... I, I don't think... If you're playing Germany in the quarters, I don't think you'd know how to play against Cole Palmer. And you have to start all four. So you have to let me know in the comments down below, but you're going to have to start all four. It's as simple as that. It really is. Um, uh, Bakayo Saka, obviously another name that basically has to be on the, on the team sheet. So you're going to have to let me know because you, if it's Palmer over Saka, then I would actually take that. But Saka still has to be involved. What a season he's had for, for Arsenal. It's been unbelievable. Um, Ivan Tony and Ollie Watkins, this is where it gets a little bit of a, an issue probably for one of these two lads. For me, Ivan Tony doesn't make it. His form in the last six months hasn't been great. Um, he's been linked to Spurs today, which says it all, really. Um, no, he's a fantastic player, unbelievably talented. But Ollie Watkins is number two on that list all day long. Right, we're going to say who I want to cut from the England side. Obviously, J uh, James Trafford is an easy one, of course. Quanzer, just because I think he'll be, a, he, I think he's got the capability to be a very, very good England centre back. His pace, his athleticism, his quality on the ball. Um, but for me, you take him out. He's a bit too early. Uh, Lewis Dunk has well been part of a really porous Brighton defence. Maybe it's not his fault. Got a lot of experience, but I don't see him influencing England at the highest level. Ivan Tony, um, third choice striker. You don't need him, especially I think if you can play. If anything happened, God forbid, to our two strikers, you can you can play the likes of um, you can play the likes of Gordon down the middle. You can play the likes of uh, Palmer down the middle. I'm not saying you'd want to do that, but I think I'd rather have that than a, a third striker, in my opinion. I think Jared Bowen gets cut. I know it's harsh. I think Cole Palmer is ahead of him now as the right winger. Because Gareth Southgate can't fit everyone in, he needs a sitter. And I don't think he sees Declan Rice as be and Bellingham as that. If we're playing 4-3-3, uh, then you have a sitter in Cobby Mano, then Rice, then Bellingham. Then he's going to find a way of putting Foden on the wing. Mark my words. Kane down the middle. Then you've only got two players that can go for one position really in the squad. And that is obviously Saka on the right or Cole Palmer on the right. Maybe you take up uh, Kobe Mano in the big games that you should be winning in the group stage and you throw in an extra player like his Palmer in midfield, then Saka on the wing. And therefore, uh, Jared Bowen doesn't make it. Maybe that's harsh. I think you, you cut out Adam Wharton. Um, my gut is like you should still be including him. He's been that good. But you never know. You never know. I think Kobe Mano holding it up for Man United based on how bad they've been. Um, I think he's just a little bit further in his trajectory and there's no point having two like him, in my opinion, but I might be wrong. 
And then the final one is Eze. This is very, very harsh because he's been unbelievable for Crystal Palace. I just don't see how he starts games uh, and I don't see how he comes off the bench to influence things. I think you have to have a clear understanding as the England manager or any international manager of how this player can come off the bench and influence things. Does he bring leadership? Does he speed the game up? Does he score? Does he? Is he a big lad up front? The, the very simple ways of looking at it. But Eze is a, is, a, is a very silky player. I think you need time to understand him a little bit. I don't think you throw him on for 10 minutes against France for losing. I don't think he changes things. And I'd rather have an extra winger, Palmer, Saka, uh, Watkins, um, to, to allow that change. Even the, the squad numbers getting pushed out because someone like Trent Alexander-Arnold, you count him as a midfielder, as an extra space being removed for Eze in midfield. And I think you can bring on Trent for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and influence the game at the highest level. And you've got set pieces, penalties as well. And it might be harsh, but that's just my opinion on Eze. I love the guy. Thanks very much. You've made it this far. Um, uh, would really appreciate if you subscribe to the channel. Uh, I'll see you very, very soon. Leave your comments down below on your England squad.